Um, okay. Um, my name's Basil Alton. This is the, the decolonization of ceramics roundtable discussion. Um, nice to see everyone here. I apologize for the slightly late um, start of this, but we can go over the eight o'clock finish if um, um, necessary. So I'm just going to um, take you through um, the running order of the event. Um, I'm going to in introduce the event in a minute. I'm running order be introductions, um, general uh, housekeeping. I'm going to introduce the panel and a short script as to the basis of this roundtable discussion. Then we're going to have um, presentations and discussion and Q&A from the artists involved, which would be Jade Montserrat first, Alessandro Cummins, um, Vesila Noha, and then Woody D. D. Othello. Um, we have a short break then, about five minutes, and then come back, um, when the break's finished, come back, and then we're going to start the round table discussion with a Q&A at the end. If, you've, if you have any questions during the discussion, or during the talk, whenever. If you could put them on the chat and then we can collate them and then um, use them in the Q&A, possibly use them, I mean, use them in the artist discussion, possibly the Q&A. Um, please um, have your mics off. Um, all audience participants are muted. This event is being recorded. Um, so questions for the chat. Question has been recorded. Um, I think that's it for the housekeeping. Okay, so uh, today's event is funded and supported by the British Art Network, BAN. BAN is a subject specialist network supported by Tate and the Paul Mellon Centre for the Studies in British Arts. The curatorial team organising this event is made up of myself, Basil Olsen, Yasmin Nettle and Jun Yun Ting. Uh, we're all members of the four members of the Emerging Curators Group from the British, British Art Network, and this is part of the seminar series. The panel includes four artists and curators, um, and this has been presented as a roundtable discussion rather than a seminar, and as an exploratory event, a starting point for discussion to hopefully result in a further set of questions and extend the conversation around the topic of decolonization of ceramics. So using post-colonial and decolonial discourse, this roundtable discussion aims to question the positioning and visibility of diasporic artists within ceramics practice and the Eurocentric and hierarchical narrative prevalence within ceramics institutions, where I'm very excited by this um, round table, and I'm really um, gratified to have um, the artists present and to have such an um, international um, perspective as well. Um, each panelist should be given five minutes to share, or five or 10 minutes um, to share an opening remark um, they'll be introducing themselves, speaking about the practice and comment on their relationship on the theme of decolonizing ceramics. Um, I will then, after the break, I'll start to feed questions to the panelists and um, we'll see the way that, where the conversation leads. Um, and then the Q&A essay at the end. Um, I think I will start the presentations now. So Jade um, Monserrat is first. So I'm going to hand you over to Jade. Thank, Thank you, you, Jade. Thank you, um, all of you, um, uh, for being here this evening. Thanks for the invitation to speak. 
hopefully you can see a screen that says clay. Um, I'm going to play this video in the background whilst I'm speaking. Um, it's the performance to camera that was shown at Body Vessel Clay, curated by Gerard Das. And that's my reason for being here this evening. Um, in as much as I am not an artist that is known for, or sadly makes ceramics, um, you will note, and please forgive the um, sort of visual furniture around the film. I haven't quite um, got how to share a screen without, um, yeah, having all of that around. So um, I can send through the link to this at a later stage if anyone would like to see it. Um, it was recently purchased by Arts Council England um, uh, along with some drawings that complement it. Um, uh, looks like my internet isn't doing too well. Um, uh, so I might just uh, freeze frame it uh, if necessary. Um, I made it in collaboration with um, Web Ellis, a duo from um, the same area uh, uh, we, we share uh, uh, living in North Yorkshire. Um, yeah, so Jara was interested, as am I, in the raw material um, clay. And um, it was, I wonder if having my work alongside the other artists that featured in the exhibition, um, Ladi Kuali, um, to Bis Bisola, who is on the call now, or um, uh, Phoebe, everybody um, with us exhibiting together um, has also helped um, decolonize um, my under my art historical understanding. So right uh, as well, right in a, that I um, studied history of art before um, turning my attentions exclusively to art making and um, the um, uh, the three year course undergraduate degree was um, exclusively white male European artists, um, despite the fact that I was, I did three years of 18th century art, the, um, the transatlantic um, uh, trade in African peoples um, was not mentioned um, at the courtauld at that time. Um, so alongside an intense period for me of um, study since um, in the last sort of 12 um, years or so, 12 to 15 years, um, alongside exhibiting and um, being included in exhibitions that um, con contextualize my work um, uh, uh, in reference to African diasporan histories and art making and contemporary art making um, is a process of decolonization um, on a personal um, uh, level. Um, I'm invested in decolonization. I um, feel that, and the examples that I've just given um, demonstrate this, that um, my 
lens has been dominated by European narratives, um, European histories of oppression, uh, of um, uh, victory, um, and not one of um, uh, oppressive realities. And um, thinking along these lines and making work in this way um, with uh, uh, the, the, the material in its raw state, um, also allows me to uh, reference um, artists that I was in, introduced to um, uh, from the Gutai Collective, such as um, uh, Shiraga's 1955 um, uh, um, Challenging Clay, which was part of the first Gutai art exhibition, considered a new form of painting. You'll notice that I'm in um, a vessel-like pit here. Um, and so, um, again, we're, we're thinking about um, one's relationship to nature and to trauma. I'm unclothed. There's a futility to my digging down, um, excavating um, the clay uh, beneath the topsoil. Um, and also this work is about land ownership and extractivism. And we can't think about the raw material without considering um, those dynamics. Um, uh, I'm also speaking about bodily ownership and colonization of flesh and by pressing into the body um the gouging the excavating this connection between the human we might also think of um diaspora and origin stories as well um i wonder um i think that's my five minutes up we we could um watch it a little bit more i forgive me um for not um pricing my um talk just now with the fact that i was going to be showing you um naked flesh um i'm sorry that i didn't uh, present that trigger warning um before that it's come after you'll have to forgive me thanks for listening and i look forward to yeah discussing it, it uh, our shared uh, passions and uh, work as the the evening uh, progresses Thank you, Jade. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that video for your um, talk. I think it was an excellent uh, start to this discussion. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Alessandra. Um, I'm going to mute myself. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. And uh, thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. I am speaking to you as a, a representative of an institution. So I'm not a practicing artist, but my job as director of the Bobbins Museum and Historical Society speaks to an ongoing relationship between this institution, which by the way, is housed in a 19th century brick built British military prison that from the 1930s onwards was inhabited, it has been inhabited by this institution. And then was, uh, the, the building was part of a nomination for World Heritage for uh, Historic British Sun and its garrison. And so in 2011, the whole process of valorizing the existence of these colonial institutions um, was very much in uh, running at that stage almost counter to the 
national narrative, but nevertheless, it was an important moment. And it was an important moment really to recognize that the historical structure that uh, we are currently in was not in itself, obviously, uh, a production of indigenous design, but it was a production of, of indigenous and enslaved labor, and that we have to recognize that whereas one might want to be indifferent or turn your face away from these kinds of physical structures, we do need to, to find accommodation in terms of what is the narrative being spoken? Not so much that it's a wonderful building and it's brilliant design and extraordinary structure and anything like this, but the fact that, as Jade has just outlined, we're talking about a period of time preceding the arrival of the museum, but very much part of the narrative of extractive power, of, of oppression, and of the ability of the enslaved inhabitants to rise above that impression, uh, oppression by uh, the deliverance of skilled labor and knowledge in that completely restrictive environment. So understanding this context in which I'm currently, and I don't know if you can see a bit of my office, but I'm in literally mm, two cells back to back, which I have try to transform with the, the color design in the space. But the point here is that uh, as an almost as an almost ongoing debate, since I have arrived here and since the 1980s and onwards, the Barbados Museum has had to look at what are they saying? What are they exhibiting? How are they telling the story? Who's involved in telling that narrative? And how is it going to address the needs of the local population? And we have had to learn over time, or rather to unlearn particular curatorial practice and, and particular epistemologies that have engaged the attention of this 90-year-old institution, whereby it has learned uh, processes of curatorship which have effectively named ceramics either as pre-colonial indigenous heritage or colonial indigenous heritage, uh, but has not done as much when you look at the labeling practices of any of these institutions, the older institutions in the region and in Europe and in Europe and Britain. The the uh, almost inevitably the practice around curating of ceramic collections is still dealing with these very long-lived epistemologies that do not allow it to emerge as skill, as art. It is very much the production of, uh, the, the, the rather mundane to day-to-day -day production of people who had to gather water from a river, from a lake, from what we call a standpipe or underground caverns. So, you have ceramic bowls, you have different forms that have gathered, I have to, I'm happy to say, gathered importance because the terms used to identify them by the population have only now been filtering in to the language of documentation coming from a, a, a curatorial standpoint. And that's been a very, very important um, point of recognition where we have to understand that what has been learned as part of museum practice, as part of curatorial practice, has been definitely been led by the dominant discourse of, of the Western white cube and still must be literally unpicked and deconstructed in a very deliberate way in order to bring 
the realization that this product, this this material, this heritage of of of, of um, ceramics can and should be um, looked at in a very different way. I'd like to ask if you could now show the image that I was I have supplied. So some of the ways in which we can look at it are of course through the individual practices of of um of extraordinary artists and I, there are a number of them um just in Bobby alone but in other places Juliana Innes Bill Grace a number of them who I cannot begin to describe how they have redefined and reformulated that material in their own terms and in their own styles and languages. But I thought one one image that I will want to show, um, Basil, can we see that image now? Please, I, I did ask for it to be available. Can that be shown? This is June speaking, it's been shared in the chat. Oh, good, okay, so people can see it. So. What that particular image is now talking about is a is part, if you like, of the the construction, the reconstruction, both first thing, of Barbadian families, many of whom post emancipation, so post eighteen thirty eight, and even to the present, are still looking for family names names that had been taken away from the time they crossed the Atlantic and were left only with those imposed Greek or Roman names or whatever names that were given to them. And now trying to find connections with family names which they have by right, but which have never been um, presented in a form that says, Yes, you are part of what this wall is called, the builders of Barbados wall. You are part of that. You have ownership in that. You need to belong to that. And um, the, the individual standing in front of it, I think most people know is Rihanna Fenty and she's standing by her own uh, family name. So the, the deliberation with which ceramics were chosen as one of those fabrics which could allow expression of individuals, not just in the forming of the bricks, because they were produced, these bricks were well produced in Barbados, but with the inscription of family names. And I think this wall was unveiled, if you like, at the time of Barbados declaring itself a republic in November 2021. I think I'll end it there for the time being. Thank you, thank you, Alessandra. My initial thoughts after the first two um, presentations is a link between the unlearning of curatorial practice and the unlearning of um, education um, of that dominant um, narrative. So there's this quite, I mean, it's quite clear um, links, I think. Um, so we're going to move. Sorry, Basil, you've just muted there. <laughs> Sorry, didn't hear any of that. So my first, the first thoughts of the first two discussions was the link between the unlearning of curatorial practice, as Sandra spoke about, and the unlearning of the um, education that Jade uh, spoke about as well. So I think it's quite clear um, ways um, of decolonization through through ceramics. Um, we're going to move on to Lucilla now and her presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Basil. Um, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to share some slides to talk about 
my work first in general and then specifically in relation to to the round table so well, my name is Visi Lanoa I um, have a Spanish happy Victoria Guinean and I'm based in London where I make and um, with my work in terms of um, is as aesthetically I would say I generally sit in between things or concepts or perceptions um, so for instance the pieces the black and white pieces on on the right on the wall this would be a bit like blurring the lines in between what is ceramics and what is painting but also maybe the pieces on the left are a bit in between the idea of the vessel of the sculpture and then I also explore that um, those yeah that 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 kind of like trying to challenge or push those boundaries in the way I, I mix clays and I and I work with different clays uh, but then also how I mix materials uh, for instance the photo on the left is the ceramics and plaster which are two materials that a priori perhaps are a big no-no to get together but there is a way um, and then also I've been working with uh, wax and bronze um, recently and moving on to how I am linked to the to the topic of the round table, and I will pick on like what Basil just said about unlearning education. And I think this is very much where I see it in the way that I am interested in challenging that that norm and those uh, like dominant narratives. Where to me, if we look at the history of ceramics, um, Alessandra was talking about. The indigenous heritage and then going more specifically for me is like the role of women and the invisibility of women of color in in the history of ceramics and because they are often not in in art museums or history books for me like traveling is is key to to kind of like dive into these these traditions and these uh ways of seeing the practice and seeing the world and so the the two photos you're looking at now are from uh, Oaxaca in Mexico from Atzompa. Um, then this one is from Morocco in the Reef Mountains and this woman is Mama Isha. Um, and then the last one is from Ivory Coast in a village in the middle of it uh, called Danosa Casu. And uh, you might recognize all the, the pieces, the images and like the the pieces in the image might look familiar with regards to my work. And so I landed in this place very recently in November last year. And I went there because I had, um, years before I had developed this body of work um, that I wanted to explore my own my own heritage and my own traditions and very much also like in this process of unlearning education and, and exploring what, what is it that we have considered valuable and, and, and worthy in, in the history of ceramics. And, and I came across the photo on the left and I thought this is not only beautiful, but it's also perfect for the story that I want to tell. And then I used it to make the two pieces on the right hand side. And it was later when I actually uh, like went a bit further uh, and I clicked on the on the photo and then I landed on um, Sotheby's website and it says um, Kwame Kakaha uh, circa 1960s or something and then Tanosakasu in Ivory Coast. And so first I felt awful because I had used um, the work of a, another woman, another woman of color without giving her credit. But then also I started thinking like, Okay, so this is Sotheby's. Someone has made a lot of money out of this. Um, still, I mean, good that there is a name, um, but then there's no there's no story. Like, like someone has completely ignored the 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 heritage, the background, the the, the biography of the artist. And if it would have been a white man, surely someone would have thought it's very important to say like who this person is. So then I started trying to find information about this woman. And in the process, I developed a collection of pieces, like 25 pieces that call Reunion and that call like that because it was a way for me to come together with this woman and what this woman to me represents. It is just another example of all of the women that have been hidden from, from our history. Um, 
And uh, eventually I arrived in Tanosakasu and I had been told that she had passed away, but on the very first day <laughs> she was there, uh, which was amazing. Um, but more, I mean, this was really, really transformational, but also I I discover, not I discover, but I, I got to know the, the pottery cooperative that there is in Tanosakasu and is um, it was started in 1986 by another woman. And it was pretty, um, I'm going to say incredible, but also very upsetting to see how in such a small space, like it's, it's, a, it's a village of 800 people in the pottery cooperative, there's around 30 people, mostly men today making. Um, but still, all of the things that, for instance, uh, Alessandra was talking about and Jade as well before, they were very much alive, you know, and how like the... Um, um, the the power the power dynamics, you know, from like Westerners going into places like these where they feel like they have like a certain level of um, superiority entitlement that clearly comes from like this like colonial past, and uh, being yeah having that sense of um, entitlement to abuse to a degree, you know, the labor of these people with all of the history and and all of the the wealth that there is. Um, so I'm still very much processing this um, experience and and I'll stop here and the next person can chat. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, and I think this is this is your travels for your research. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're going to move on to Woody now and then after Woody's presentation we're going to have a have a short five minute break yeah thank you guys uh for having me um and Basila that was really incredible um my name is Woody I'm an artist working out of Oakland California by the way of Miami I'm first generation American both of my parents are from Haiti um and I've been working in ceramics for about 10 or 11 years. And, you know, I just feel very grateful and fortunate to have found ceramics because it has been this like access point in terms of learning about a pre-colonial uh, connection with clay. I think ceramics inherently, when you study it, you know, you just, it, there's so much inherent history in it. So it's really opened up this gateway in terms of, you know, decentering thoughts before, you know, I feel like a lot of the rhetoric, at least in America, is around colonization and slavery. So it's just like a lot of the language and vocabulary about what happened prior to colonization gets lost. And ceramics has been this um, gateway for me to connect with, you know, these different histories, whether it's Yoruba or Igbo religion, um, learning about, you know, just Jenny sculptures and that tradition, learning about Dogun statuaries. I feel like, you know, all of this stuff is, is, is linked to clay and, you know, clay comes from the earth and it has this memory and it makes these connections between, you know, the present day and the past and, you know, brings up all these complex narratives around ownership and land and resources. So I feel like for me, this idea of decolonization, you know, I feel like ceramics has been the gateway. And, you know, I'm like thinking about how, you know, it's just a way of life. How do I become, you know, a responsible and better, you know, person, not only in like, my arts practice, but in my community as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like a lot of the artwork I'm making now is referencing, you know, these various histories of ceramics, particularly like Nikisi objects, you know, this idea of like anthrop anthropomorphizing everyday objects and viewing them with a sense of spirituality, um, you know, but it's also connecting me with different histories and religious histories in Haiti, thinking about this idea of like the Govi pot, which is like um, a ceramic vessel that is meant to reclaim the characteristics of our lost ones and lost relatives. So I feel like, yes, yeah, ceramics has just been this incredible resource that has unlocked 
you know, a, a path and helped me connect on a deeper, more spiritual level and, and, and has provided me with a sense of, of strength and pride and really navigating, you know, a lot of these Eurocentric narratives. So I'll end my <laughs> presentation there, but um, yeah, it was just like really amazing to hear all of you guys talk and share, um, you know, thoughts and I'm excited to uh, kind of dig in a little bit deeper with the, the questions in the round table. Right, thank you, Woody. I remember, I remember um, speaking to you after the Strange Strange Clay um, exhibition at Hayward. Um, I'm not sure when that was now, uh, two, or, two, or th two or three years ago. Um, we're going to pause there, have a five minute break, and then come back to continue the um, conversation. So um, it's 11 minutes past seven. So we'll come back at 16 minutes past. Sorry to be so um, exact with my timekeeping. Because I'm very bad at the timekeeping actually. So I'll be quite strict. Um, so I'll see you all at 16 minutes past. Thank you.
Yeah, it's just waiting for Alessandra to come back. Hello, everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming back so quickly. So we all start, start off with the uh, run table, the actual questioning and discussion now. Um, I'd like to pick up on uh, a point raised by Jade I mentioned before and Alessandra. Jade mentions the idea of how she had to decolonize her own idea of Shamit's practice. And Alessandra, idea of unlearning curatorial practice, and asks the question: um, How can we utilize critical ceramics art practice to question dominant narratives and make a space for institutional change? Um, would anyone like to pick up on that question? Yeah, Jake? Yeah, Thank you. thanks. Um, I was just thinking, I don't, you know, I'm vague when it comes to um, ceramics. So I'm really speaking from the perspective as an artist that uses all sorts of materials and mediums and um, forms. Um, but I was thinking in relation to the unlearning that you picked up on Basil and that has been mentioned, um, how um we we are introduced to um uh ceramics or the value of ceramics in museums and how they arrange themselves um is on a colonialist a co colonial prep there it's a colonial premise um these taxonom the taxonomies are predicated on histories of um, accountancy, i.e. Um, a sort of uh, white supremacy uh, or white supremacist vision for organizing um, the world. Um, so uh, I am not sure how, um, in practice, space for institutional change um, can manifest. Alessandra um, is doing that work and has a much better idea than I, um, but I guess it starts with ripping it all apart, the structure of it and starting anew, but Alessandra um, uh, is much better as the others are much better placed to speak to that. Well, thank you for throwing me on the fire, Jane. <laughs> um, okay, the, I, I am speaking from the point of view of the institution curator and what have you. How, how we, and, and Rhiannon, by the way, I saw your question, but I haven't had a moment to, to fill in and, and respond. So hopefully I capture some of that in my response now. What I, what needs to happen is first of all, self-awareness, because, uh, you know, I've been uh, working in this field for a long, long time. But I simply took it as read that what we call ceramics are the wonderful Bristol and London and beautiful uh, uh, ceramic pieces, porcelain, what have you, that inhabit our plantation rooms. And that was ceramics not necessarily recognizing that what well, was equally ceramics were the archaeological remains that, that have been excavated for centuries um, 
um, but the treatment of those pieces were literally, you know, the leftovers of of a of a past race of um, indigenous Amerindian persons who were not civilized enough to be considered ceramicists, ceramic artists. And similarly, the, the material culture that emanated from the, um, the colonial uh, structures which allowed, um, which allowed enslaved peoples, literally the only time of their own um, in which to produce for themselves, inclusive of ceramic uh, jars and jugs and, and various vessels which they could use or which they could sell in the marketplace on a Sunday, very, very much circumscribed, as you said, by the, 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 uh, the very accounting practices the legislation and even restrictive movements of individuals from the plantation to the marketplace and back. So that the, the productions of those people were seen very much literally as, as you know, very mundane, very ordinary, and not really worthy of, of consideration in the same way that these other ceramic forms were shown. So very much the language separated archeological or even if you like ethnographic, how on earth do, do we talk about Caribbean museums having ethnographic collections unless we're talking about putting the very same beautiful ceramics in that terminal, in that kind of labeling, which we don't. You have to, we have to understand that curatorial practice in the Caribbean, up until fairly recently, I would say literally in the last, only in the last 20 years, has really been shaped around understanding, uh, shaped around following the professional rules of engagement that have been taught to us and that we have accepted were the norm in how we did our curatorial work and what we chose to put on display and what labels we chose to give those things. Works by unknown, uninteresting, indigenous or enslaved people, as opposed to works of, of supreme beauty, which is what some ceramic pieces or indeed of, of supreme beings could be considered side by side. And understanding that if we continue that process, that kind of trope, we are continuing a practice where Europeans had started by othering us and that we in a sort of perversion were othering ourselves in the exhibitionary practice that we have learned. So we have to unlearn that. Access. And part of the way I was going to answer, Rian, and part of the way we have begun to address that is dealing with co curatorship, co creation, and also understanding that our processes of display and exhibition and what have you need not solely inhabit the gallery spaces such as they are within structures but can in fact be placed on the exterior and open air and in fact give opportunities beyond the scope of, you know, the white cube as I said. So there are a number of different narratives that go on in terms of the, the language, the labeling, the taxonomies that are continually respected but not necessarily understood need to be disrupted. The, the organizational arrangements around them and recognizing that we still have a lot of work to do and that we have to be very, very present in the doing in order to be able to turn those kinds of narratives on their heads. So hope, hope that wasn't too um, 
too circular, but in a kind of way, the process is. If that's some, um, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, I wanted to add it also because I mean, to me, it's interesting to look at like the museums and like what is in the museums and who are who who is part of the curatorial teams and therefore making those decisions. But then also like what comes behind that. And I think education is key there. And you talk about like self awareness, but I mean, it's, at least speaking like from like like the UK higher education and the specific places where one should go and study ceramics because that's the way to then be able to be seen and exhibit and all of these things that are not accessible uh, mainly financially you know and I think um, there is there is perhaps like a new energy in terms of uh, finding alternative spaces for for communities to get together and learn in a in a different way, and that with that comes also like a sense of um, empowerment and invisibility and representation that then kind of like becomes it has like a snowball effect that I feel like is is important because then um, if I see that Jay is doing it, then I can believe that I can do it, and then we will be more people, and then we could push those narratives, you know. And this, for instance, it will be interesting to know as well, Woody, like how it is in the US um, in this sense, but. In London, there's Mad Belly um, ceramics, for instance, like really um, embracing all of these or the studio of Chris Bumble per se is another institution, you know, so it's kind of like what, what is an institution and what else can we create? Not necessarily from a place of otherness, but from a place of uh, ownership um, to be able to take up more space, perhaps. Yeah, I think here in the in the United States, like the dominant narrative is like this colonial narrative. So when thinking about, you know, for me thinking about blackness, it was always in relation to um to slavery, unfortunately, not until graduate studies and really kind of like investigating the 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 history of ceramics on on a deeper more personal level that I was like introduced to these other histories and these other more afrocentric you know ways of of viewing the world so I do think there needs to be an in and making more um more effort to kind of center the uh the narratives and and the voices of the quote unquote others um but i do feel like very positive now cuz i feel like a lot of artists have the time and space to kind of really delve in to their ancestry um oh no i think i might be frozen That's no, okay. Did you guys hear any of that, or uh, yeah, I'm yeah, I don't some... think. Okay, sweet. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, Ireland. Okay, so what? I mean, this is really, really interesting to start start this um, conversations. What I'm picking up on is this, like, kind of a, a non hierarchical use of material. And this idea of co-creatorship, um, co-creation, using the um, trying to gauge some kind of multiplicity of voices, and not using a single single narrative or any kind of um, colonial linear narrative, um, using voices from different places from. Um, different um, histories and the idea of a, a new energy with community spaces also making it a bit more democratic uh, its practice. I love the idea of how with Alessandra how European ceramics is thought of as ethnographic and the way that it has to be a, a kind of um, level playing fields where the values attributed to um, works from enslaved people are looked upon in the same lives as 
works from um, more um, almost established um, ceramic uh, um, producers. Um, so I, I really like that way of um, thinking. Um, I like to go into a different question, but actually speak to Priscilla and um because one of the one of the talks I've done recently was with the ceramics British ceramics Biennale, and there was someone on that uh, Masimba who spoke about uh, how he was trying to revert to uh, another way of looking at clay, and he used um, he was from the Shona people, and their idea of his idea of the universe was his ancestors were from below. So when he used clay, heaven was on heaven was in the earth. And he was using that idea with clay. So when he used clay, there was a different process. There was a different um, uh, reality to him using clay. And whether, Priscilla, whether in your um, travels around uh, the Ivy Coast, if there's been a, a way of how um, in your travels, how people use clay, how that's influenced the way you see yourself using clay as well. Mm. I remember that from, from the talk and I, I love it. Um, I really love it because it's, it's this sense of we are standing on all of this heritage and, and we're very much part of it. And uh, instead of like thinking it's somewhere above us that is unreachable or something. Um, so the the way they use the clay or they relate to the clay um is not that spiritual from what i saw in particular in in tano sakasu um but i think like like in all the places where i've been to um like that it's still or still like they use traditional ways of making because that's what it is um there there's a there's a very high level of respect towards the material, um, because it is the land and it is the soil, and and also because it is so linked to I mean, is their livelihoods and is their environment, and it's something that we definitely don't have um, in mega cities like London because of our relationship with with anything you know everything is a commodity and we just buy it and we don't understand where things come from and and therefore um that connection to perhaps the history or the heritage or the ancestors is completely lost um and that's like for me also like what jade perhaps is trying to do with with her performance you know and that engagement with the soil and and, and with the land so yeah, I didn't see anything uh, like that. Um, but for me, it was um, I feel like these experiences are very grounding to me, um, and and they really remind me of like why do I make and and what is it that like how do I want to approach it? What what do I want to talk about with it? And and it, from that lens, as we were saying, of um, challenging the, the the traditional ways of like having a study day, like how it is displayed, how it is um, recorded, documented, etc. So it's, it's, if it feels like going back to going back to the land and going back to to the the, the origins, if you like. Yeah. Um, I do think like the notion of thinking about our ancestors as like underneath us in the ground versus like in the heavens is like a radical way to like just think about existing you know because when we think about our ancestors being below us then you know we have to kind of like be forced to think about how we're taking care of the planet and the earth underneath us um there's this really amazing writer that I've been kind of like engulfed in his world for the past couple of years, uh, Mali Domo Patrice Somi. He has these books, um, The Healing Wisdom of Africa. And um, there's another book that I'm not remembering right now, but he talks about that, like our ancestors being below us and, and, and the dagger of cosmology. And I think like 
you know, that is a way of like rethinking and re-envisioning these kind of like colonial perspectives. Because I feel like a lot of us think about, you know, when we leave the earth or when we cease to be like our soul goes into the space or goes beyond the earth, but we're really here. So I think like just thinking about the kind of relationships with ceramics, like, you know, it does force us to think about, you know, how we're taking about taking care of the land and the environment. And, you know, I also do believe that the uh, the clay, the soil has a memory. So that's a way for us to access, you know, our past and to be able to learn moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, the, the that idea of like our ancestors is 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 extremely radical. I would add something related to that, something that I've actually experienced myself. And I I did this project, the one I was talking about that you saw two photos, um, the two first pieces I ever made with the uh the two legs. Um I used clay from from Bane, which is my dad's uh, village in Equatorial Guinea, and it's clay. I didn't, I didn't take it. It was my parents who took it, and then they brought it to me, and then I made a collection, like two collections of pieces, and and I was using the soil. I was using like the land of my ancestors, and actually the clay had been taken from like the land that had, belongs still to my family, and it was my grandparents and great grandparents, and um, and through that I I engaged with with my own. I own heritage and who I am today as a woman of color. And I went to Equatorial Guinea in April and it was the first time in 13 years. And when I landed, I felt that, you know, I had, I had developed a relationship to the land by using the clay, but from the distance, but the, the moment I arrived there, I embodied it and I, and now that you, the way you've talked about it, Buddy, is really, it's very much, was that experience of like I I've connected to my past and, and my family by using their soil, our soil, my soil. And and because I was doing it from somewhere else, I only realized when I arrived there. And um because it was extremely powerful and, and, and beautiful. Yeah, I think that that is like, yeah, that just that seems incredible. Um and even, you know, going back to what Alessandra was saying about, you know, just looking at objects in museums, too, I think, like, artists were able to, like, fill in that gap. If it's, like, a utilitarian object, if it's a sculptural object, like, I feel like, you know, artists are able to kind of uh, make that connection and create, like, this critical fabulation of, 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 you know, how society existed before what these objects were maybe used for to start to paint a picture of what what kind of like this indigenous tribal life might have been like. Um, and I think those are all skills that we could use like moving forward and on a more like material practical level. I'm referencing this writer, Molly Doma again, but you know, in terms of like, you know, one thing that's super kind of like central to this idea of like decolonization is how do we kind of transition from this individual pursuit to kind of being more in community. And I think ceramics is a perfect example of that because anytime I've read any type of like historical um, practice of, of ceramics, it's not, it's not happening individually. And Bissela, you're showing images of like people making ceramics. It seems like ceramics is made in community. Yeah, and this kind of um, a little bit goes against the grain of my understanding of, of pottery ceramics in this country with the ceramics education kind of studio pottery. It's the individual in the studio making work for for themselves, making work for others, but it's the individual in the studio and this almost like a lack of um, community. Obviously, communities exist. So the ceramic community is, is massive. But it's idea of the actual process of making is an individual um, endeavor. And it's um, juxtaposed to this a sense of community and other 
um, other cultures. And it's um, kind of uh, lends itself to the next question almost. Um, what strategies can we employ to decenter, resituate, and re envision to, I use the word emancipate, the narratives and spaces that occupy our art institutions? But it's not, it's not such a leap because we're talking about, let's say that um, an earth is, the earth is heaven. That's a, that's a complete role reversal. So that question isn't so far away from where we're talking. And the idea of um, um, deconstructing to um, reconstruct, you know, disassemble to reassemble, um, we have to think in a slightly different um, manner, almost. Um, can anyone pick up on that? Basil, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or leading from the previous question and also taking note of what Eva was saying. Um, but um, I was just, I just really want to um, stress, um, yeah, again, what Eva's brought up in the chat. When you were talking about, uh, when we were talking about, um, uh communality or community around ceramics it just struck me that i what came to my head um uh and this is going to be tangential i'm sorry the way that i speak is um a symptom of uh, uh my neurodiverse brain that um goes in different directions but i it led me to thinking about one of our most prominent ceramicists uh, Grace and Perry, who's been in the news recently about um, uh, his massive um, uh, bill, electricity bill or gas bill. Um, and I was thinking about hyper individualism in the art world, this sort of, um, again, very masculine, um, uh, heroic individual, uh, benighted individuals who then lament that they are, you know, my bill is too big. Um, and it's like, well, so, so what? Because actually um, we're still um, uh, fixating on you and your problem when actually I, I think of ceramics and, and this idea of decolonization in ceramics as a what's been discussed uh, so far is that it's a return to the land, a return to um, processes that, as Eva has um, uh, pointed out, um, have been made void in the West with industrialization. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Sorry to throw us off track. No, I mean, the whole arts industry, like, and, and like just in general, like I think mounting a museum exhibition, there's so much labor that goes into it that gets, you know, like swept underneath the rug or even the hierarchies. I feel like if you took away all the art installers, how does a, how does a show get mounted? You know, so there's like this weird hierarchy that happens where everybody is just in, integral to making the work. And like, I don't know what Grace and Perry studio is like, but you know, it's just like most, for the most part, when you see these huge exhibitions get mounted, like there's an artist who has like a team of other artists who's helping them in the studio to make the work. And like, I don't understand how movies have like an entire credit list, but like the art world doesn't do that. It's extractive, however way, whatever way we're kind of looking at it. At present and that thank you Woody is what needs to radically change um, because also if we think about education in schools uh, higher education even universities people are being set up you know in, in, in to compete uh, with one another for precious resources as well you know um, how we um, and, and actually it's we can that's what we can change i think maybe you're 
Yeah, you're no, you're absolutely right. I guess, you know, in, in terms of thinking about ceramics and thinking about like pre-colonial societies and the ways that people have lived before, you know, survival is really tied to a group of, of, of people tied to this idea of community. And for some reason, you know, which is probably going to be an entirely different panel. It's just like, <laughs> you know, I don't understand why in the West things are just so indiv individualistic, you know, and credit is not given where, when credit is due. And I think that, you know, the kind of transparency and, 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 and you know, it, it just goes a long way, it goes a long way. I think uh, about that, I've one topic that I have started being very interested in is the the concept of authorship. You know, which is very much what we're saying now, and how um, perhaps all of this is related to capitalism. And at the end of the day, in the art world, some one thing is sold. So one person needs to make that money therefore there needs to be an artist there needs to be a name and the individual needs to have that fame and and get all the credit opposed to what you were saying about about the movies in the way that I guess is is also that idealization of like the artist as the one person who makes this thing rather than being understood from the very beginning as a practice that is collective uh, or that can be collective and therefore it's obvious that it needs to be credits because the director cannot like right and and be the camera and, and all of these things and and i think really going back to the, the topic as well it is that with that idea of there needs to be a name attached to the object so that we can understand it and we can give it value and it can it can be part of this thing that we call the art world then if we go to certain practices where it is communal and often the pieces are not signed because it's not about that it is about making something that is going to serve the community in one way or other then obviously um going from that like western capitalist perspective then we're not going to consider these uh valuable or art or at all because it doesn't so it doesn't go through the checklist that we have, you know, because it has a different purpose. It's been done differently. Is is done by a group of people, perhaps, and therefore this is this cannot be us, you know, from like from that lens. Hmm. I was wondering whether um now might be opportune moment to it's 10 to it's 10 to 8 to open it up for the audience members if they like to um say something uh, a question um it's been really interesting uh, uh talk so far it's gone into areas i didn't even um envisage so it's uh a benefit. Um, just for a check, chat. Okay. So, um, one that, until a question comes, one that we were just waiting for a hand to go up or type in the um, uh, um, Q and A. Um, it's also the this. The, um, specificity of play, which is an importance with the um, Alessandra's um, piece that she sh that she showed with the names in play and the the idea of it how it becomes something um, mnemonic and the idea of um, commemoration and with Jade's uh, use uh, way, way that you're digging. In the clay from your from the um, video, also as well, Woody, some work which I saw in a strange clay exhibition. It was almost melting the clay, and the idea of um, time, how time is almost almost warped, or time is folding, and um, each of you use the clay in a a way which obviously individual to you, but um, it's the actual material. Which speaks, and um, I know I don't keep on talking. I know Jade, you keep on saying that you don't. Um, you're quite new to clay, but it's this idea that 
this is a very strong on the idea of how it's a, um, a hierarchy of material and that people come to clay with a, a fresh perspective. That's, that's what I really like and that's why um, that's what I really, what really like about this panel. And so um, I wonder if anyone can say something about the way they use um, clay and how it affects their, what brought them to it, how it affects their practice. I'm leaving that question to the artists. I have thoughts, but I'm going to wait to hear from them. Well, say, say your thoughts. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, very, very quickly and off the top of my head, to me, the importance and the value of clay is that it's one of the few materials that you can mold and make things with your hands. You don't necessarily need any other tools. You don't need necessarily any other contacts. But the direct contact between you and the clay, I mean, Jade took it to another level with her uh, presentation, if you like. But it is, and but I do like and subscribe very much to that uh, comment that was made earlier about the heaven is in earth. Because I think from what I have seen and observed by uh, with the ceramic artists that I have come to know and, uh, and appreciate. It is almost, it, it, it's both hard work, but it's also spiritual in its intensity. It's almost visceral. And at the end of the day, it's not easy to, to demonstrate that whole uh, engagement, that whole, um, uh, coming together between the human heart, the human brain, human hands, and earth. And I think that we we kind of miss the point in many, uh, many scenarios when we are seeking artist statements or what have you. We are not quite getting to grips with that very, very um, profound connection, which can't quite make it onto the exhibit wall unless you are, you know, including videos of someone actually engaging in, in their practice. So to me, there is a lack of language which enables us to, to make that connection at the most at the most basic and human level. Um, and, and which is the beauty of, of clay, really, in terms of it being an art form, but not even an art form, uh, in terms of it being part of your being, if you like. I, I don't know any other way to describe it. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, I feel like so. I got some questions. Oh, I was just going to say something about you know, kind of like the artwork just being like this, like evidence, like when I look at pre-colonial objects, we don't have the language, you know, to kind of like decipher the intention or like what was being made. The only thing that is left there are like the formal qualities and, you know, the kind of like evidence and texture of it being manipulated by somebody's hands. And I think that is like the beautiful thing is that, you know, there is an understanding or a type of affinity that you can have with an object just by looking at it that doesn't require language. So the, the kind of like spiritual and emotional transference is almost, at least to me in times, more powerful than being able to understand something with like human language because things could get convoluted with language, but if I know I feel something in like my chest and then in like my 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 stomach and kind of like, you know, in my bone marrow, then I feel like that's an even more transformative experience than having all of the language, you know, in the world. So I think um, 
you know, these people made or like we, we look at these objects that are like thousands and thousands of years old and, you know, they're not here to speak for it, but they still are being collected and hoarded in different museums and put on display for us to to speculate and, and, and fabulate what that what that um what the reason and the, the intention is. Thanks, 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 Willie. Um, I just saw some. We've got some questions here now. Um, Eva. Hey. Okay. Oh, I think I had uh, my hand up first, and then it was Eva, and then it was Ray. Please go ahead. I, okay, I, go I on, go on, then, Yasmin. Okay. Go on, Yasmin. Um, yeah, just following up from following on from what Woody was saying, I think it's. I have a question about or comment about permanence when thinking about clay objects and how, and I'd be interested to know about research that the artists and historians here have done um, about, you know, these objects that we look at, they were supposed to be touched, they were supposed to be used, they were supposed to have a non-permanence to them. And this idea of keeping an object on display so that the audience can or the observer can project their feelings onto it, as opposed to an object being used to carry water or to be reinvented to something else to fulfill a need for a new generation, for example. That is what we we don't get that in, in objects in museums. It is objects that are sitting behind a glass to stay there forever, for conservatives, conservatives to work on and to preserve it even um, you know, I don't know if it's important that it it wasn't ever meant to be preserved. It was meant to go back to the earth. It was meant to be mended and used, used and mended. Um, so it's just more of a, yeah, it, I'm thinking about if I was the next step of this decolonizing ceramics practice, and if there was to be an exhibition of something that, you know, the emerging creators and Basil and June and I um, may be interested to do, what might that non-permanence of objects look like um and and what could be meaningful like what what would be meaningful there um so a little bit of a ramble a little bit of a comment and <laughs> a question all in one thank you yes um Well, um, some some of this is already some of this is being done, um, but for love, I me, mean, I cannot remember the artist's name. That is really bad. But she did um a big piece at the V and A um in a fountain. Uh, she makes uh, works out of unfried clay, and then she uses water to. Um, deteriorate the clay through through Phoebe coming. Thank you, Claire. Um, she makes she, she uses water to um, through time the, the clay starts to starts to uh, go back to the earth. It starts to disintegrate, and and that's um. But it's, that is about process. That is about time. That is about the natural um, evolution of clay. So. That's and that, and that's in an institution as well. That's in the in the VNA. So I think these that's that's one way of doing it. And it also sets the mind how this is documented, if it's if it's documented, and then what happens to that document? Does the does the document then become part of the artwork as well? Um so it's all um uh ways that the the um institution can be uh, revisited with um, the ceramic process. Um, does anyone else like to? Or should we just go on to the next question? You know, I do have like just a thought um, about that. Like, uh, Yasmin, what you said like is very <laughs> like true in terms of, you know, the objects were meant to be used and, and, and kind of like activated in a sense. And 
you know, given that museums are are kind of like existing in the ways that they're existing, and you know, a lot of art uh, artists are making objects to be on display. I think, like, you know, for me being an artist, you know, the the exhibition is one point, but you know, how am I able to kind of like, you know, just be in community and like give space and access to other artists and opportunities, you know to other artists. And I think that's a way that, you know, even though the actual ceramics, you know, isn't like necessarily doing that, but, you know, the, the idea of decolonization is, for me, just like, how does that get embodied in everyday practice? So, you know, isn't necessarily just tied to the actual object for me, but it's just like thinking about navigating forward and just being, um, you know, being like a person in community and, and like being able to help out my family and things of that nature. I think that's a way that, that, you know, we could, at least I'm thinking about that. I could follow up very briefly along those lines, Willie. Thank you very much for articulating that route. But I would say that one of the, one of the most important parts of the practice that has been going on uh, for decades now is in terms of when I, when we say co-curation, often it's believed we're talking about the end result, the product. But uh, we we have to acknowledge, um, certainly in our context, and I'm sure elsewhere, that in in earlier times, what has happened is that there have been knowledgeable artists or ceramic artists or potters or whoever even, who have been willing to prepare the earth so that they are that other artists who are not in that position are able to take that material and and form their own um their own works which they would not have been able to do without that assistance of the knowledgeable um uh, producer there are others who have allowed their, their kilns to be fired um, and to be used not just for their own purpose, but for others, I would say in the community, but you know, where in that context, I'm talking about the artist community. Um, there are still others who have helped with the um, production of the, of the different um, uh, source, products that uh, that can um yeah, I can't remember that you 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 allow it to run off the the product and allow to take control of what the imagery is like on the on the actual pottery and what have you. So to me um in a sense we 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 tend because that is the trend with Western artistic notions of authenticity and authority to be prepared to speak to the the ideal artist as being the singular person who has evolved and, and mastered their production when in fact what what has been most beneficial and has been almost most important has been the artist as activists, the artists as um, as 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 communal um, producer, and I see that not just in ceramics, but I have to speak in terms of people producing film, people producing uh, other kinds of work, whether performance art or or visual arts, and as I said, in ceramic art, what has been most important and most valuable is the co-creation aspect where the idea is not coming from one head but several minds working together towards a goal and I think that notion kind of gets lost in the in the way in which we we tend to validate or valorize um, the product that emerges. Yeah, and this fits in this idea of the multiplicity of origin as well, I think, Alessandra. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's go one question from Ray. And then um, I think there's one, one, another question, and we might look to wrap up then. 
but we're going to ask Ray for their question. Um, hi, sorry, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. I was just, there's been a little bit of talk about language and I was wondering if anyone has any like thoughts about what is considered pottery and what is considered ceramic. And obviously there was some mention of the kind of wares that indigenous people would produce in their own time. And yeah, particularly, I guess, in a museum setting, like what is displayed as what and yeah, I don't know. Well, what is pottery, what is ceramics is kind of key to uh, Alessandra's um, answer, the things that I valued. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's a question. So, um, uh, it's really difficult to answer because it's, it's the idea of um, this hierarchy. You know, I, it, it took, personally, it took me it took me a long time to have ownership and say I'm a potter. I always wanted to say I'm a ceramicist because, for my mind, that was um, a higher uh, calling or something. And the idea of being a potter didn't really appeal to me because my uh, ed ceramic education was to be a ceramicist. But now I've kind of come full circle, and I and I I take ownership of that and say I'm a potter. I also say I, I'm a um, plumber sometimes as well. No, I'm joking. No, but you, you take ownership of that of that of that term, and it doesn't. It, it, it's an idea about language, and it almost doesn't doesn't matter. The idea is that you're using clay. And it's your and it's the intention you have and the uh, integrity which you apply to the apply to the material. It's it's a, it's a material to be um, manipulated and to be used as some kind of vehicle. So the term, from my mind, potter and uh, pottery and ceramics is interchangeable. One can be one and one can be the other. Um, But um, if anyone if anyone could add to that, we might go on to the next question. I think there's another question. I think it's from yeah, uh, um, Yasmin. Did you have you got a question? Um, no, I asked my question. So I think there's some. Uh, uh, Rhiannon has put one in the uh, in the Q and A. We've also got an anonymous participant as well. Okay. But I'm aware we're coming to ten minutes past. So okay. I think it has to be very, very quick because I don't want to keep our participants too long. Um, okay. Well. Okay, great. So the question from the piano, um This is question for Alessandra. A question for Alessandra, recognizing how inherent colonialism, how inherent colonialism is in curatorial practice. But if you could reimagine curatorial practice, what would it look like and feel like from a pre or decolonial perspective? Hi, I think um, Rhiannon and I agree that I did rather engage that question earlier on so that uh, I, I didn't um, type the answer, but I did answer her in an earlier question contest. And I was talking about it in terms of um, co-curatorship and, and, and the whole business of giving artists and communities agency and, and uh, relevancy um, without necessarily insisting on the authority of the cur curatorial role. But what, what I might want to do is uh, respond to the anonymous participant who asked about the description of the building that I'm talking about. Well, uh, the, exp the experience of interpreting objects and experiences in a context with such an overwhelming history and memory. You know, this is a good point. Um, and this is, this, is, this is the key issue that we deal with every day because uh, in some ways it has begun to be addressed in that artists 
uh, are expressing themselves more and more by saying they want to do they want to do an intervention in our space. To me, that is great because they're saying we're taking ownership. We don't agree necessarily with the way in which you have offered interpretation of objects or experiences in in the traditional historical exhibits or even in the, the the traditional artistic uh, exhibitions. We have a different uh, view and we want to express it. We want to use that space to do it. In a sense, that is what um, what uh, we were doing with that group of the the photographic collective of five young uh, women artists who took control of um, not just putting up a series of historical postcards or images on the wall, but completely deconstructed those images and presented their own vision for what that might be. There are other there are other exhibitions that I really am extraordinarily grateful to the artists who have wanted to do that. Not as I said, um, necessarily all ceramic artists, but all artists who are saying, you know, this historical structure that you're in, even though it's providing gallery space and and um, curatorial time, um, this isn't right for the 21st century Caribbean. You have got to do more and you have got to give, if you like, I don't, I don't like to use the word validation because we shouldn't be called upon to validate the artist's ideas and expression. Rather, we are giving, let's say, giving agency, giving uh, advocacy. Uh, we are enabling activism in a certain way by those kinds of re- interpretations of the, the the objects that are currently in our in our collection and also looking closely at the way in which we can um we can commission and support artists in terms of their production and in terms of the, the ways in which they want to express themselves in those spaces. And that to me has been the most meaningful way in which we've been able to, to deal with that experience of taking over these military, historical, colonial spaces and, and making it our own. So I hope that helps our participant. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Asandra. Um, very in-depth answer. I think um, we... I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I'm aware of the time, and I have to apologise to the pa panellists for this overrun. Um, and um, to the audience as well for, for, the, for the overrun. But it's been a really uh, engaging um, conversation. And it, it, and it was uh, hoping, I was hoping, we were all hoping, Myself, June, and Yasmin were hoping that we, it would take its own um, its own breath. It would use its own momentum, and um, so I'm really happy with this. And uh, thank you for everyone who's participated, the panelists and the audience members, and the questions as well. Um, it will be recorded. Um, it is. I mean, it is being recorded. It will be published at some point as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the for invitation. Us. Really enjoyed it. Great conversation. Looking forward to more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you all. Well, not Jade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good to meet all of you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much, Basil. Bye-bye. See you. Thank Bye, you. Jade. Thank you, Thank you, Woody. Thank uh -huh. you, Jade.